Thank you, Jeremy, for coming and joining me on the podcast today. You are the co-founder and CEO of Circle, the financial technology company behind USDC, uh, one of the two most prominent stable coins in the world. And you've been in this space for over a decade now. Circle is really one of the oldest companies in crypto. I think a lot of people who have gotten involved more recently might not sort of know that. Um, so looking forward to diving into all of this. But before we get too deep into Circle or USDC or anything, I think it'd be great to uh, hear your origin story for those who don't know you. Um, just the earliest you're willing to start to where you are today and uh, talk about some of the decisions you made along the way. Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, I'm, 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 I'm happy to, to start relatively early. Um, I think, um, you know, maybe the key is sort of just generally kind of how I got into, um, got, got exposed into sort of technology and, and entrepreneurship a little bit. Um, and, and then kind of the path that led me on, um, so I was, um, uh, you know, I think very, uh, lucky in that I was sort of born into what I call the, the Apple II generation. So when personal computers were, were just coming out, um, you know, the Apple II was like a, a pretty cool computer and, and my, my father got one. And, um, so I, I had an opportunity from very young age to just like learn about the kind of empowerment that came from you know, uh, from, from personal computing and, and from, you know, very early on, I was also interested in like how, how to connect that to the broader world. And so, you know, it got involved in pre-internet online communities and, um, you know, all, all kinds of fun stuff. Um, and I think also was inspired by, um, you know, really the, the, the kind of heroes of the personal computer revolution, um, who had kind of talked about the, the fundamental empowerment that came from putting this kind of tool in in everyone's hands and what that could do to society. And so I was sort of, you know, followed, you know, Steve Jobs and Mitch Kapoor, who invented, you know, Lotus one, two, three, and obviously, you know, Bill Gates and the Microsoft story and others. So kind of had that as a backdrop and was sort of self-taught technically. Um, and then um was very, really lucky in um in college um that I, I actually got access to a high-speed internet connection into my dorm room. And this is in like 1989, 1990, right? In 1990. Um, and back then, you know, the internet didn't really exist in, as we think of it at all today. It was a sort of research and education network that was connected to military networks. But there was sort of this crossover of scientists and researchers that were connecting their networks around the world um, to this through TCPIP, the, the, the open protocols. And so I became enamored. I was studying political science, e economics, and philosophy, and I was studying kind of the collapse of the Soviet Union and the kind of um, emergence of uh, uh, and the kind of competitive forces of different economic systems and, and, and political systems. And I happened to be quite interested in what was happening um, at the kind of end of the Soviet era and what was really powerful in 1990, this is just as revolutions are really sort of starting to happen in, in significant ways. But I, um, I was able to connect with people who were, who were in the Soviet Union. I was able to connect with people who were in kind of conflict zones in other places. And the, the protocols that were available to do that were like, you know, the Usenet news protocol or, you know, email, uh, what are called listservs and like these sort of communications tools um, through through these open networks. But I was just completely blown away by the possibility of an open network that was built on open protocols where you could all you could just read the specs of these protocols. And there were like libraries and software that anyone could implement. And you could just if you had a computer, I was just a guy with a computer in a dorm room. I could connect to all these. And then all of a sudden there was this whole world. And so that was like a revolutionary experience for me. And I just found myself, you know, becoming really um, obsessed with open computer networks and all the kind of protocols and the possibilities of disintermediation and decentralization of information and communications and things like that. So that, that was sort of a backdrop. And then, um, you know, I, I got in, I, I got involved in entrepreneurship also very early like right out of college. And partly I attribute that to um, my own, my, my dad actually, who 
had you know, tried a lot of different things and he had started his own software thing and he and he just took risks with his career and I and I saw like oh you could like try anything it didn't really matter you didn't have to like have a career for one thing for your whole life and I also had a Montessori education which I I think contributed to um uh, a little bit of my my mindset uh when it comes to exploring things and taking risks and stuff um but anyway I think I I um I found like when uh when I graduated college in 1993 like the the what spoke to me was the open internet and I was like I'm going to commit my life to working with this there was no web that didn't exist although there were early web browsers like the CERN web browser was when the first graphical browser on a Mac it was it was really limited um, that was the one that Tim Berners-Lee had created um and then Mosaic came out and it was one of these moments where um, you know, I, I literally, the, the week it became available to, to use on a windows computer, I, 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 I had it. And it was again, one of these like aha moments where you're like, okay, like all these ideas that I had about how the, how the internet could be an open network and you could basically build software applications that connected it, that, that became really clear to me. And I then pursued the idea of essentially the web as an app platform, that the web would become like an operating system, that you'd actually be able to write code that was running on servers that then like could distribute software out to any end computer anywhere in the world and people could interact with it. People could then communicate through those apps. So got very excited about that in, in, um, in 1994. And that led to the first company that I helped to co-found Alaire Corp, which we built um, Cold Fusion, which was the first commercial web application server. So like an app server, which is sort of how you take code and run it on a server and connect it to databases and run transactions and render dynamic web pages. So it was like a very revolutionary product. Um, and then we built out like a, you know, uh, some of the most popular tools for building the web, basically building websites, apps, um, infrastructure, content delivery systems, and grew that, took that company public um, in, and, uh, and then eventually, um, merged it into uh, Macromedia, which many people know from like tools like Dreamweaver or Flash Player or other things that um, then went on to be part of Adobe. But I was a CTO there. And I think similarly, um, there was sort of another, like I, I kind of think of that web 1.0 epic as sort of the birth of, of protocols like HTTP and HTML and the web and what that allowed. And a lot of entrepreneurship came from that. And I was sort of a you know, a, a tools and infrastructure provider to to everyone who was coming up with ideas in Web 1.0. And, and we had, you know, millions of customers around the world that used our software. And then um, in, in like 2002, I was, as CTO of Macromedia, I was part of kind of launching a new platform for how you could do essentially like really rich, immersive media and communications applications and video applications and other things that only became possible um, in the context of sort of web 2.0. So the idea was two-way information exchange and publishing, two-way communications, not a one-way kind of read only, but it was sort of read write. And and uh, actually in those days, new people like Chris Dixon and um, you know uh, uh, the founders of Twitter and others who, um, who, were, who were involved in kind of the first apps that kind of took those ideas forward. And I focused on the like the media side of it, but there was again Web 2.0 was a convergence of things. It was broadband, it was Wi-Fi, it was you know improvements in the software um, technology that could deliver like a higher fidelity user experience. So that led me into kind of wanting to kind of transform how um, video and television distribution happened by moving that to the internet. So the first was sort of how do you move content and how do you move software delivery to the internet. And then the sort of next was how do you move actual like really rich forms of communications to the internet? Again, on this idea that open networks with open protocols that are decentralized, that anyone can plug into, any device that can speak the software protocols can plug into, could transform an industry. And you know what I worked on also uh, you know kind of became a widely used piece of software and services and went public uh, as it took that company public as well, but. It was part of a broader set of things that were going on around um, that that new set of possibilities that that happened uh, on, on the internet. So that's sort of like the overall origin of kind of my entrepreneurship and early technical beginnings and uh, and things like that. But that that all kind of predates um, predates Circle as well. 
Right. Well, we'll uh, first of all, I appreciate the story and, and it's a great one and unique, I would say, maybe not like completely unique, but very different from the vast majority of stories, origin stories I get for people on the podcast, just in that you've sort of experienced a generation of technology when it comes to the internet that a lot of my guests, you know, haven't. Um, and, you know, you talked about accessing the internet in your dorm room in, in the early 90s. This was, like you said, you know, pre-browser, pre pretty much everything that people associate the internet with today. Yeah. And not only did you witness that and observe that, but you were a central and integral part of that and building these tools, like you said, for, you know, all the way back in, in web one. Um, first question, you know, I've got a bunch just coming from the story alone and, and might have to scrap the, uh, the game plan that I had coming in. But, um, when you rewind back to, you know, those years, like whether it's in college or soon after graduation, working on your first company, um, I imagine, you know, here's this new thing that you're obsessed with the internet and um, you really believe in it very strongly, but it hasn't like, you know, taken over the world yet by any means. And so you have some sense of faith that the genuine innovation here is going to be, it's sort of inevitable um, that yes. it's going to grow. Totally. Um, and presumably that translates to your sort of perspective on, on crypto dating back, you know, again, a decade uh, totally. from, from today when, when Bitcoin first came out and you, you know, you went and founded Circle. But inevitably, in those first 10 years, there's, you know, some level of volatility, maybe a little bit less so with internet, because there wasn't sort of like prices associated with everything like there is in crypto. But even still, there's regulatory uncertainty. Um, yeah. Things are kind of slower than you might expect them to be in a lot of ways. So would you say that now, you know, having weathered these first 10 years and more than weathered, but thrived in, in these first 10 years of crypto and, and building something within it, um, is it a similar feeling of sort of faith? you know, with moments of doubt throughout that, that uh, where someone who didn't live through that might not have as much confidence when they have those doubts that, you know, crypto is for real and, and it's coming and it's sort of inevitable. Um, yeah. Do you think that that's similar to what it was like with the internet and you actually saw it come to fruition or was there, are there elements between the two that are kind of different, maybe from like a regulatory perspective, you're a little more wary that we might get this incorrect uh, from like a US perspective, whereas we got the internet mostly correct? It's a great question. Um, and and I think um, my experience, it's, it's, it's interesting because obviously like as a, whatever I was, like a 23 year old, uh, you know, getting started in, in technology entrepreneurship and the early internet, et cetera, like I didn't know much of anything, <laughs> you know? but I had really high conviction about like how the web open, how the open internet and open protocols and open software and, you know, the web itself, like how that would become like this application platform and what that would do and how, all the opportunities that would come from that extremely high conviction. Um, and if you ask anyone who worked with me then or knows me from then, you know, I was super evangelist, right? Like I, I was, I, I believe strongly and, I tried to translate that conviction into like, okay, how do we like, how do we move this like forward to the, like the next step to like fulfill that vision, knowing that like there were so many things that weren't possible at the time, right? Dial up internet was awful, right? You could, you could barely squeeze anything through that little thin pipe. Um, and there were no mobile devices. There were, there were so many things that were, were um, that were really hard. Um, there was no wireless, there was nothing. Um, so, there was simultaneously like, you know, even delivering what you could, even within the constraints, the literal physical constraints, the capital constraints, other things was enough to kind of fuel, fuel you to kind of keep, keep pushing and, and going on. And I think, um, uh, you know, even though there weren't like, you know, asset prices, there were stocks, right? People were buying stocks and there was a speculative gold rush and there were, you know, people with a, a PowerPoint, as they'd say, uh, rather than a white paper, but people with the PowerPoint could like IPO and like you you had a speculative boom and bust and you had a huge run up in, in expectations for all the transformative things that could happen. And then when, you know, a combination of macroeconomic conditions changed, like the interest rate environment and the macroeconomic environment changed and people realized like, all the big ideas that people were putting out there that were people were putting huge amounts of capital behind, they were just going to take a lot longer than people thought, or people just lost faith entirely, right? So you had a huge crash. 
99, you know, 95% value destruction in most companies, lot, not just scores and scores of companies just out of business and so on. And actually venture capital just stopped wanting to invest in the internet, right? 9-11 happened. It was all then became about enterprise security. Like it was like this whole different thing. And e-commerce was kind of declared like basically a niche. A lot of the ideas around digital media were considered totally pie in the sky. You know, there, it was it was really written off. And and the 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 risk takers, i.e., the theoretical risk takers, which the real risk takers are the entrepreneurs, but the VCs, you know, sort of stepped away, right, uh, almost entirely. Um, now, I I had like higher conviction than ever in like 2002, 2003, that like wow, the conditions are really emerging for this next generation of this that's really going to fulfill. A lot of the ideas about how you could actually deliver like high fidelity communications, media, software, all this stuff, and just kept pushing, pushing, pushing. And so tying, tying it to, 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 to crypto, like what was interesting for me when a lot of the ideas crystallized around Circle um, in, in early 2013 um, was I saw it very similarly to where we were when like the first when Mosaic first became available, right? Which was to say like the technology is really raw and like the, it's there's so much, there's so many ideas on what could be built. And, and if you really like listened closely and you listen to the technical communities that were early in crypto in 2013, so many of the ideas are now like flourishing, right? Smart contracts, extensible, extensible blockchains, like more scalable, you know, even things like zero knowledge technology, like all these things were talked about, but but were kind of not there. Um, but as a technologist, I could look at it and say, okay, I can see all the all those things are going to happen. And I'm patient now, now that I'm a little bit more mature and I have more experience, I'm patient to sort of see this take longer. And and you know, one of the things that was compelling to me about founding Circle was it was going to take a long time because it was it was such a big change that was going to take place and it was complicated and hard and involved changing laws and i figured wow that's going to be really hard changing laws all around the world to accommodate this new internet financial system and what could come from it like that was actually compelling to me as a founder at that stage having taken two companies public it was compelling to me that wow this could be even more impactful than the web right and I told everyone who I founded the company with and all the early employees, like, this is going to take 10 to 20 years. Like, don't, don't join this thinking like this is just going to be this, this like overnight success. It's going to take 10 or 20 years. You know, I hope that we can have really great products that are along the way that move us towards the vision. But like, it's going to, it's going to be hard. It's going to take, it's going to take a while. Like the technology that we wanted to have in place to launch what was now USDC, like that didn't exist when we started. We thought it would take three, four, five years, and it did. It took like five years before the technology of blockchains even got to the place where we could even execute the first core idea that we had, basically. Yeah, it's really interesting. And uh, I'm curious the difference between, you talk about like with crypto, a lot of the early people in crypto, just Bitcoin at the time, pretty much were talking about some of these ideas that are now, you know, 10 years later, 15 years later, finally come to fruition. So there's some, you know, group of, sort of future applications or, or technologies that are somewhat foreseeable, if not immediately possible. But yeah. then there's a whole set of other applications, technologies, whatever you have, whatever you will, that that is sort of unpredictable by nature because they come from these technologies that may, maybe these, these yeah. predictable technologies sort of lead to these unpredictable technologies. And in crypto, I think like a good example of this is like, you know, NFTs sort of blindsided a, a good number of people, at least in their in their mm -hmm. scope. And there were, you know, early experiments long before like the 2020, 2021 hype cycle around NFTs, like sure. crypto kitties and things like that. But I don't think people saw that as being like the Trojan horse that would bring crypto into a lot of the mainstream yeah. or something like that. Um, yeah. And presumably there's, there's other, you know, things to come. For sure. Um, so I'm curious, how do you, you know, with the internet, for example, like, what were some of those foreseeable things versus the unforeseeable things? And how do you think yeah. about that in terms of crypto today? Yeah, I mean, like, um, I think um, 
I mean, it's, it's interesting, right? Because sometimes like there were a lot of ideas in the early internet about, for example, like how you could do like, uh, you know, voice over IP, for example. Like it seemed obvious, oh, you're going to be able to do voice over IP. Um, and there were there was just tons of companies that tried to do this and tried to do all these things, et cetera. And like the tech wasn't quite ready, right? The the software availability wasn't quite ready. There were just like a lot of little missing pieces. And then it's sort of like a timing thing when enough certain things come together and then someone executes the right user experience. Skype was the product, obviously, that that really did that. Um that it like really takes off. It's really easy for someone back in say 1996, 1997 to say, everyone's gonna be able to have like software they can communicate over the internet. And and like, and you could even have really, really smart computer scientists like hammering away on that problem. Uh, but like, it's just, it, there's just a convergence of things that have to happen to make it ready for that kind of like that, that takeoff. And I think like things that, uh, that occurred, you know, later, like, there were so many different takes on communities uh, and sharing information in communities uh, that happened online. Yahoo groups, uh, you know, uh, was like a huge thing and GeoCities and these first generation internet kind of online communities and then MySpace and, you know, but cracking the code on like how to make you know, your trusted group of friends share photos together. Like that was the thing that that really kind of caught fire and that was hard to predict. Um, but it was all in a space where like everyone seemed to like know, oh, this idea exists, we're gonna be able to do this, right? Um, I think similarly, like um, there was sort of uh, uh, blogging, right? Everyone thought, oh, blogging is this, this, and I was very, I was very active in, in the birth of, of like blogging standards and, and blogging software um, and was doing video blogging from like back in 2002, 2003. But um, the kind of concept of microblogging came along and that was like what Twitter was. And so there was like, oh, there's this thing, microblogging. And it was like, is that really what people want to do? Is like these like 140 characters, like an SMS thing that you're doing. And like, but clearly it, like it was like a form factor that like worked and it exploded, right? So that was hard to predict. But like, again, like there were a set of conditions that really kind of came together and then mobile devices sort of came online at a time where like, SMS and that form of messaging and it could, can the user behavior could all kind of tie together and, and make that work. And obviously other examples would be, and I use this one a lot because um, I, I, I talk and it ties into your question. I, I talk a lot about how, you know, um, once you have, you know, these public chains and you have programmable money like USDC and you have smart contracts, it's like, wow, what an incredible creative surface entrepreneurs and technologists and developers are going to invent so many new uses of money that we've just never thought of, right? We, we don't even know what they are yet. And that's exciting. Like, cause people ask like, what's going to be the, the, the killer app of stable coins or what, what, what does it mean that you can have programmable money? Like, what are you going to be able to do? And I, I, my answer is it's sort of like asking someone like in 2007, um, like in the iPhones coming out or 2008 when the iPhones coming out, like, what are you going to be able to do with like, like the ability to, to put a piece of software on, on an iPhone, right? There was not even an app store yet when the iPhone first came out. And then when the app store came out, that was right in the generation of iPhones where you had 3G, so you increased the bandwidth a little bit and you had a GPS they put in it. And, you know, people are like, oh, you're going to be able to replace your Garmin GPS in your car and have like turn by turn directions from your phone. Wow, that's really, that'll be great. But actually, no, it was, you know, Travis who invented Uber and like, revolutionize the transportation and logistics and delivery and like these huge changes in society, but no one, no one could quite see it. Um, no one could quite see it because the pieces weren't all there to put together. And that's what I, where I think we are today with the crypto economy and where we are today with programmable money is the pieces are now coming together, like good UX, scalable blockchains, like, you know, kind of these new legal forms of digital money in the form of stable coins and, and, and developers are just now starting to get unleashed on it. And so like, I actually see like this kind of exponential curve over the coming years, that's going to be like from all this invention that's going to happen with new utility for money that we just haven't seen before. We haven't, we haven't seen uh, solved, but like, that's the creativity that's available um, to, to the world today. Um, and uh, anyway, sort of tracing back through a little bit of 
um, these different epics of the internet and what's expected, what's unexpected. The, the obvious idea is like, it's very easy for everyone to say, you know, like cross-border payments are going to be instant and frictionless and free. And like, that's just going to work. Like, it's obvious that's going to happen. Like, and it is actually happening, but like which apps, which utilities, which protocols, how's that, like, what's going to bring that to life? Like WhatsApp brought to life, you know, billions of people with free communications. Like, so there's these moments of kind of how the software comes together, which will, will, will have the, the kind of these dramatic scale experiences as well. Yeah, it's it's interesting. You you know, you take the the Uber example, and um, to your point, like people could maybe more easily predict, like, okay, you'll be able to have like your place, your Garmin with your phone. You'll have you know directions to anywhere on your phone, and that ended up happening. You know, like Google Maps or sure. Apple Maps or whatever. Yeah. But then beyond that, was sort of less predictable. And it takes yeah. like a great entrepreneur to sort of piece that together with the UX at the right time, yeah. everything like that. And I think to your point, right now, it's foreseeable. Um, a lot of the parallels to what we have in the financial world today. Yes. You know, coming on chain and and sort of uh, you know, the web three version of all these things with DeFi right. and everything like that. But then it's the level and, and that probably will happen. Like it seems somewhat mm -hmm. inevitable that that will happen. Um yep. just like you had Apple Maps and just like you had Google Maps. But then the question is what's the Uber? And yeah. the interesting totally. thing is like, you know, um the internet was mostly dealing like in terms of information and now we're dealing with crypto more so in terms of value. Yes. And this is like, just as the, the, the inf what information could sort of do was difficult to foresee because it was just genuinely unprecedented. It's similar with value now. And like, we have totally. this assumption of like, okay, we've historically, we have been able to like buy and sell things and we use money for that. And, you know, there, and then, you know, we have various financial tools, but right how does that like that could fundamentally change in a way that's like very difficult to foresee right yeah i mean i i completely agree i mean i think we, we take a few things uh as as sort of assumptions right so so one assumption that we have is that um the advent of stablecoin networks stablecoin protocols and and this new form of fully reserved money um you know that that effectively like the the blockchain networks that that kind of those those new protocols and assets can kind of perform on um will will drive the marginal cost of storing moving value to zero and and that will um you know creates an environment where you can very dramatically increase the velocity of money and if if you sort of study the economics or monetary theory or you look at how central banks think about economic activity, this sort of money velocity is this really powerful thing. And I think by analogy, when you think about the internet, when once you got the marginal cost of like sending an email to zero or the marginal cost uh, of, of publishing a piece of content down to z effectively zero or the marginal cost of having a peer-to-peer uh, -peer voice uh, or, or video call effectively approaching zero, right? then like the net world output of those things just like went exponential, right? When the marginal cost of delivering a piece of software to a browser was effectively zero, right? Then you could have software that could be consumed through browsers by billions of people. Um, and so when you, when, you, when you have that happen with, with, with value exchange, when you have that happen with the, the, the mechanisms of value exchange, it's pretty profound, right? Because this, this radically higher money velocity, it, it, sh it should lead to this, you know, the net world output of say transactions that happen, financial transactions that can happen should be multiple orders of magnitude larger than it is today. And that's, and, and then that creates all kinds of other like challenges, right? Because when money moves, there's risk. Okay. Well, what do you, there's, there's, you know, there's, there's kind of, um, kind of r risk of people like you giving people money as a loan and then them not paying it back. Right. There's risk in terms of like, people stealing the money and there's risks of people doing illegal things with the money and there's so there's a whole bunch of risks and so how how do you deal with like a this hyper high velocity globally integrated globally interoperable kind of monetary model and and deal with those risks that's where i think some of this stuff coming back to one of your earlier questions is harder right because um because you start you start intersecting with things like you know, national sovereignty, you start intersecting with geopolitics, you start intersecting with, um, 
uh, kind of fiscal and monetary policies that exist around the world. And, and, and those have been, those are built up into very deep, deep institutional infrastructures that are at the core of the nation state system. So it's not, it's not as straightforward as, hey, everyone just got Skype and now we're all just having voice calls, right? So to, to people in crypto, I think in some ways it feels that way, right? Once you're like, oh, I have a wallet and I have USDC or I have, you know, whatever, you know, digital token and, I, and I'm just like interacting in the same way I do with other forms of software on the internet, it, it feels inevitable because it is inevitable. Um, but there's like, there's other challenges that, that come within it, but I think, um, so anyway, we take for granted this kind of, this kind of, uh, this layer of infrastructure and what that will mean. Um, and we hope to be uh, an important, you know, part of that infrastructure. I think, um, you know, one of the things that I think is really interesting is, um, you know, just like the internet, because everyone was connected and you could exchange information and eventually you had some forms of, of ways to like transact uh, like credit card collection or, 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 or things like that. You could really, um, you know, you could reinvent um, different using marketplace models. You could really reinvent a lot of different um, forms of industry, right? You could reinvent the ad industry and how attention was packaged sold. You could reinvent, you know, obviously other content industries, but you, you know, even Alibaba and Amazon, sort of this concept of like deep, deep, deep long tail markets where I might invent something and I'm in one part of the world and now it's available to everyone in the world. And like, and, and that's a really powerful thing. And I think that it's likely that um, how we think about markets for capital today um, are gonna look radically different in 10 years. Um, that like we have we have notions of markets for capital and some of those are the the markets for capital are are kind of you know uh, markets that are established and you know through very clearly defined products that are packaged and sold through banks some of those are through different types of um, investment funds um, and then and then the actual capital markets like debt capital markets equity capital markets foreign currency cap capital markets right these markets, but I think the, the building blocks that we have now through on-chain money, on-chain governance, uh, you know, through programmability, um, through high velocity money, through all these things, I think that really creates some very exciting opportunities to reinvent the way capital works more broadly. And um, I, I've used this metaphor in the past, but my own view is that like the building blocks that we have with blockchain networks and stable coins and 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 um, digital commodity money as well are are kind of like the 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 kind of technologies that were at the birth of modern capital markets and banking, the joint stock corporation, certain forms of kind of common corporate law, um, and then you know kind of terms of of how you know banks and exchanges and other things could work. I mean they go further back in history, but like the 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 kind of explosive growth that happened with those. And it feels like we're we're really coming into an age of an internet financial system that looks more like the internet communication systems and software systems and information systems, but it's a financial system. And but the the impact will will um, be on how kind of social, political, and economic or organisms you know function. Yeah, it's um, I feel like your sort of thesis around all of this is. Uh... It, it seems to align with a thought that I've had that uh, I, I could not support with like in, in the technical way that sort of you have with like, you know, all the all the financial old lingo and everything like that. But um, this concept of like, you know, you talk, you talk about marginal cost, you talk about these, these risks. And again, I'm like, if I'm thinking with like the information to value analogy, um, you know, there were there were certainly risks. It wasn't all great that, you know, information became zero marginal cost. It's on the net, you know, I'm, I'm pro technology. I think on the net, it's, it's great that we have people are able to like freely share technology, uh, share, share information and everything like this, but you know, on the, on the transfer during like the migration from one era to the next, you have these power structures being disrupted and mm -hmm. with information, it was more like, you know, the people who control the information. Um, and when you convert that over to money or fin financial systems or value, it's the people who control the money. 
and mm -hmm. the implications of that are sort of like difficult to to foresee in some ways but um you know we're we're sort of in the midst of maybe that now we're like with information it's not like the u.s government was controlling information i mean to, to some extent maybe they were but there's like a few networks and you yeah. know you turn on your tv you have like a few channels and and that's sort of like yeah. where you're getting your information and now you go on twitter and everything yeah. you see on these legacy channels you can now double and triple check on twitter and whatever and it's not you know it's a world of lower trust that sort of comes mm -hmm. out of that because this thing that you previously didn't really have the resources to question yeah. you now do um, and so that, like there's pros and cons, you get maybe better, more accurate information, but mm -hmm. you have a lot less trust. There's no like single party that you can like turn to and just believe sort of for better or worse. And if you apply that to money, it's like, well, what happens when you decentralize control over money? Um, mm -hmm. And given that that's like a major le lever for governments. And so I guess, you know, th there's a bunch of things that come out of that, but one thing is like what the proper, you know, if, if you're like a big media company at the start of the internet, you kind of want to go like all in on the internet, you know, it's going to be disruptive, but you'd rather sort of disrupt yourself than, than just get disrupted. Like ideally, if you could have built Twitter as, you know, CNN mm -hmm. or whatever, you would have liked to have done that. But it's not as clear to me, like what the U S should do with like the, the, you know, the world reserve currency, yeah. um, you see something like Bitcoin come about what do you do about that? You know, mm -hmm. like I know there's, you know, as a, as a CEO of a big crypto company, you have certain, you know, preferences for, for what you would like to see, I'm sure. But, um, from like a U.S. perspective, how do you even treat this new thing? That's, you know, a threat, but also possibly a boon to your, you know, country. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, there are a lot of different ways to look at it. If you look at it strictly through the lens of sort of the, the, the United States as the sort of with the dollar as a reserve currency and, you know, kind of, um, you know, the United States ability to continue to kind of finance its debt and uh, the, the kind of geopolitical consequences of, of dollar hegemony, hegemony or, or, or dollar weaponization. And like, if I'm thinking about it at a national security level or at a, at a global macro political and economic level, right? I'm, I'm thinking about one set of, of major issues. But what I do know is, right, I, I, I do need the dollar to remain highly, highly competitive. Um, and there are more rising, there's more rising competition. And so the competition, right, there's there's two, two, two ways, you know, the, the, the dollar asset itself is effectively the, it, it, because it's fiat, it's full faith and credit, right? So full faith and credit is effectively like, can does the rest of the world continue to believe in the credibility of the United States government's ability to repay its debts? Or what that really is, is does it believe that the United States economy will continue to be a thriving, innovating, productive economy such that the economic output and the ability to effectively generate taxes and repay debts is there, right? That's that's sort of like you're, you're taking a position on that or not. And so that has to do with like, the, do you believe in in the the country's ability to support, you know, breakthrough innovation and and economic productivity? And interestingly, I mean, the breakthroughs in AI, the breakthroughs in synthetic biology, actually a lot of breakthroughs in crypto, a lot of breakthroughs in quantum. The United States is playing a huge role. EV, other things, China as well. But the United States is playing a huge role. So right now, it's sort of it, it seems like the dollar the, that 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 credibility piece is still there. And, and, you know, I was just at an event this earlier this week where, you know, the strength of the U.S. economy is actually remarkable compared to, to so many other parts of the world right now. Um, the flip side, though, is it, it's sort of a, it's a technological competition, right, which is the form factor of the dollar and what it mean, what does it mean to have a dollar or a digital dollar and, and, and this sort of internet technology competition that exists. And, and again, like that's an opportunity set for the United States. And that's where I think, you know, having, you know, US federal stablecoin laws is really powerful and important because it, it creates a, a, a framework for private sector innovation with good supervision and regulation and creates a, this new form of money, this digital cash equivalent money on the internet that is dollar based and dollar backed. So that's something that that can be looked at there. But, but I think more broadly, stepping away from the dollar issues for a moment and just thinking about the bigger 
arena of like crypto and the technology of crypto and blockchain infrastructure and others. Um, you know, I, I look at that more like generalized infrastructure for the internet. And, you know, my view is that US policymakers, every every government in the world, I don't, you know, I'm I'm interested in sort of how this impacts the whole world, not just the US. I happen to live in the United States, but the government should be looking at that as, wow, there's like this breakthrough new infrastructure on the internet that allows for, you know, incontrovertible data and, you know, uh, direct uh, transactions on that data between people without an intermediary and, and trustworthy computing and this sort of resilience from cryptography and in, in, in information and, and, and the ability to prove things and attest to things. And the impact of that on so many different industries is really profound. Like, let that grow, right? And even things like digital tokens as mechanisms of incentive design and um, the ability to manifest organizational forms that are entirely mediated by software on chain and have governance mechanisms and the like, this is really powerful new material. And it's and it's like it's like new material where just like you know becoming a web company or an online company right is is like building an on chain company is is really what that might look like and so I think it's that whole arena when you step back and you think about like what governments ought to be doing is encouraging the the development of these new institutional forms, encouraging the development of these new systems of economic coordination, encouraging that, yes, like dealing with things like data security, privacy, fraud. I, there's like real things to to address with it. I'm not saying it's just like everything should just be run wild, but I do think that there needs there needs to be a a, a shift towards saying, wow, this is a critical infrastructure layer that for the next generation of the internet that is going to change how society and the economy and even organizations as a whole work and how productivity happens in the real economy, that should be the view that, that governments are taking. Um, and uh, right now, it's it's mostly just kind of reacting to the speculative pieces or reacting to the fact that there are all these unregulated vehicles and venues that are being ab abused by criminals and fraudsters. And so there's real stuff that they need to react to. Um, so I, I think that that's also important, you, you, you know, to to address those those kinds of things. But I, I think, um, you know, zooming out and seeing the the bigger picture of of what this what this kind of change represents is is also important. And 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 taking more of a laissez faire approach, in some ways, like was done with the internet in 1996 um, and the late 90s by saying we don't know exactly what's going to happen here. Uh, we know we don't want certain, you know, we're going to have rules around criminal conduct or rules around, you know, certain types of, of activity, um, but we're going to kind of really see what people can invent. And and I think um, that, that, you know, for, for crypto more broadly, I think that's probably the right posture. Yeah, there's um, a couple of a couple of directions I, I want to go with that. Um, I guess first, first and foremost, you you mentioned earlier, you know, the velocity of money, how USDC or or you know crypto more broadly can can change that by you know not just like percentages but orders of magnitude. Um, and you know, currently, like we you know we have the Fed. The Fed will like you know change interest rates to sort of manipulate that velocity of money in a way that they try to you know keep all of these measures in a place where we like them to be. Inflation mm -hmm. being sort of top of mind for a lot of people um in a in a world where that velocity of money changes for reasons that are sort of outside of government control or interest rates you know banks ability to man manipulate or anything like that is there concern of like sort of runaway inflation or something like this that might not be in the you know in the span of like a year but it, over the span of a decade or two where um the you know it, it turns out that these potentially these, you know, internet native currencies such as like Bitcoin are or, or something else potentially are are just better suited to, you know, sort of survive and, and thrive in a world that is, you know, internet based money and internet based transacting, internet based um mm -hmm. everything, basically. Well, um one one can so I, I believe in digital commodity money, meaning I, I believe in the long-term you know, potential and the current 
potential of, of digital commodity money, non-sovereign digital commodity money. And Bitcoin is, is sort of the, the best known uh, uh, of, of that ilk. Um, right. And, and I, I believe in digital commodities more generally, meaning a, a digital token that is a commodity asset that has utility as a commodity uh, that, that also is something that is you know, economically exchangeable. Um, so I, I believe that's significant. There'll be more and more digital commodities. Um, but I also think that for coordinating economic activity on an everyday basis between people and households and firms, um, you know, everywhere, right? Um, price stability is really, really critical. Um, and you, you know, you, you need to be able to know, like when I order that, that part that I got it at a, at a, at a value and it's going to be delivered at that value and you know, price stability is really critical. Um, and that, that doesn't change. Um, and so I think, um, you know, sort of stable coins, uh, attempt to do that and they're they're bound by how price stable the fiat currency is that they're they're backed by um and so i do i do think there's an unknown um you know high velocity stablecoin money that is fully reserved by us government obligation money behind it um i do believe that the interest rate transmission mechanism will continue to exist so it does not interfere with the interest rate transmission mechanism per se um but I believe that the credit intermediation layer, which today is is a is a um, a leveraged model, principally a leveraged model, uh, although becoming less so as non bank uh, private credit firms take on more and more of the credit delivery in the at least in the U.S. financial system. Um, so you have the kind of levered forms of bank lending, and you have non levered, generally non levered forms of of private credit, like credit intermediation could be improved substantially by moving to an on-chain financial system and on-chain treasury management and, and um, smart contract intermediation for economic contracts. If you can do those things, you actually could have a dramatically more effective system of credit intermediation. And then you combine that with kind of the fundamental interest rate mechanism that exists. Like you actually... I believe it's possible to kind of maintain price stability, get the benefits of this higher velocity money, um, and and actually have that higher velocity money be based on a full reserve banking model as opposed to a fractional reserve banking model, and actually have an underlying economic, monetary and economic system that is safer than the historical banking and financial system, and sort of less prone to some of the risks that drive historical booms and busts. Um, so I think there's a lot to chew on there for central banks um, uh, as, as this kind of uh, technology grows. Yeah, I definitely, uh, you know, I don't envy that job of like the, uh, you know, Powell at the Fed or, or whoever it might be. It's obviously that, you know, there's a lot of critique that goes around and, you know, some of it may be fair, other, others might not, but it's a difficult position to be in. And same with, I think, you know, a lot of like U.S. legislators where, you know, some people may have you know, bad intentions. I generally like to kind of give benefit of the doubt that people are at least trying to do what they think is right. And uh, they might have different priorities or, or whatever, different things that they care about. But um, it's a difficult problem and uh, extremely fast moving time. And I, I guess the hope is that um, the US and to your point, other countries can get this right. And if there's any sort of over indexing that I do, in terms of like the US regulation and, and all of that, I think it's primarily do i mean first of all you know like you I, I live in america but um a lot of people just kind of copy paste u.s regulations in a way or at yeah. least do something that's not going to be you know um too many standard deviations away from u.s regulatory policies so um i know we're coming up on time but obviously we're you know we're in an election year um there seems to be a, a good amount on the line um you know with all of this regulatory uncertainty people you know it's always difficult to predict with crypto, like, you know, these price cycles and, and things like that, but there's a general kind of assumption based on history, you know, not necessarily repeating itself, but rhyming that, you know, in the next year or two, there's going to be another sort of like upswing of the hype cycle. All of this is sort of like coming together. Um, I guess, you know, presumably you, you do a lot of, uh, you're, you're one, probably one of the best people in the world to talk about sort of like the state of affairs with, in terms of how the U S government and other governments to your point are thinking about mm -hmm. this. 
Um, how are you feeling about that overall? Are, are you hopeful and optimistic? Are there concerns that we actually could like devastatingly get this wrong in some way? Um, what's like your, your current temperature on all of that? Yeah. So I guess I, I look at it from a few different angles. Um, I think, um, you know, w w one is just generally all around the world, um, regulators and policymakers are just getting smarter and smarter about all this, right? There's just more time that goes by and there's more practitioners and there's more technology and there's more, you know, there's good actors, there's bad actors, they're di better able to differentiate and understand what some like the, the real risk issues are and kind of how to address some of those. And, um, and, you know, in a lot of places around the world, um, governments are really leaning in on Web3 uh, as a concept, meaning like, hey, this is this new technology generation and it's it's creating a lot of opportunity. And I see that from, you know, Japan to, uh, you know, to, you know, Singapore to even, you know, the EU where they have this comprehensive regulation. But the fact that they have comprehensive regulation is sort of like a green light to like go and do stuff, right? So with, with MICA. So... I think, um, and you're, you're seeing um, you're seeing a lot more understanding, and 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 I think um, that's really good. Like like compared to ten years ago, it's obviously very different. Uh, compared to two years ago, it's different. You know, it, it it really it continues to evolve. And at the end of the day, right? People are intelligent generally, and and they they wanna they wanna see you know good social economic technological progress, like like broadly, we're not in a world where people want to like put that all back. Um, and so you are going to have different reactions under different political systems. The the kind of the kind of blockchain infrastructure that China is is getting behind and they're doing a lot with blockchain is there's a huge amount of state intervention in that, right? I think the kind of blockchain innovation that maybe we'd like to see um, you know, in what we call the West, right, is is maybe more more open. Um, and and more like the open internet. And um, so I think, again, there's like really good progress that's there. And I don't like, I myself don't ascribe too much to, you know, Republicans are for and Democrats are against. And you see a lot of that on crypto Twitter. And you do see political statements from different wings of parties and other stuff. But like, I look at like the work that's happened around stablecoin as an example. And, you know, you've got You've got Republicans and Democrats. You've got, you know, national security hawks and, you know, uh, progressives. You've got, you know, the 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 agencies and the White House. You have all these sort of stakeholders, and they're really trying to get to the bottom of it and say, like, how do we how do we put something together that that really works? And it's that's good, and it, it suggests that um, there's not a for or against uh, in, in that kind of world. And I think that's ultimately going to be the case with with digital tokens and 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 markets regulation as well. It's like the innovations here, and there are some differences for how this works compared to past, um, you know, things. And so that's the job of lawmakers is to kind of differentiate that. And and um, and and so I I believe that that will happen, um, and that is happening around the world. Um, so yes, there are ways that things could maybe, you know, quote unquote, go wrong or go, uh, you know, not have, uh, not not move in the way that you'd want them to move. But I, I'm, I'm also, um, I, I, I believe very much that kind of the technology utility and the kind of path of open source creativity and open internet software innovation, right? That just happens and just like keeps being birthed. It just keeps happening, and society, which I include individuals and firms and and you know all all the kind of actual society, right, gravitates to utilities that improve what they can do in the world and improve their economic condition or their outcomes. And I think that this technology is going to continue to prove that it can do that. And at that point, it doesn't matter what political party you are, right? Then it's sort of the will of the people, which is to say, like you know, the, the incremental progress in terms of this technology and its utility is ultimately what will get reflected in law. And uh, like law reacts to the things that that drive forward in the in in the entrepreneurial and, and technical and innovative space. It may come in fits and starts. It may come in other ways. I was listening to a, a book uh, earlier today 
uh, which was, you know, making reference to the the invention of the of the kind of the loom and you know the ability to use a loom to uh, it was the birth of the in industrial revolution and the loom was actually invented by a Frenchman and the French government was so threatened by it and what it might do to kind of the the, the kind of peasantry and others that they destroyed it and said don't do it whereas in England. They created a patent system and they like supported this and the tinkers and the inventors and it sort of it was a broader discussion about the birth of the industrial revolution. But I think, yeah, you can have societies react differently and it can it can lead to very different economic outcomes. But I genuinely believe in the age of the internet and the age of open software that that um, that progress kind of kind of overcomes and ultimately uh, laws and regulations kind of reflect what um, society uh, holds holds dearly. Yep, well, uh, I, I definitely share that view and uh, I'm optimistic on, on what's to come. So appreciate you taking the time today. I know we're up on time, but um, fascinating conversation and uh, excited about everything that, that you've been doing over the last decade and how it's finally, uh, you know, over the last few years with USDC or last several years, I guess, with USDC. And now, you know, it, it feels like we're on the verge of sort of a big, a big time an inflection point basically with with crypto and uh very excited to see sort of what comes out of that so appreciate the time and uh yeah looking forward to uh to sharing this with with people thanks jake my pleasure